Okay, it's one o'clock by my watch, so um, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, welcome everyone to our 11th confab today, talking about tricks and trip tricks and tips with paleontological collections. Um, and we're really, really excited to have two experts who are going to give us their um, their knowledge and insight onto this issues. Um, um, related to all the paleontological collections that some of our small museums all over the state have. Um, before we begin, we like to uh, do a land acknowledgement. Um, so we acknowledge that the land currently known as Colorado has been the traditional homelands of indigenous peoples since time immemorial. We are grateful for the work in partnership with the 48 sovereign nations who continue to call this land home. Together we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs to share the history of Colorado. And I just wanted to let you know that our next confab um, will be um, talking about disposition and transfer of state collections. Many of you may have heard um, that um, the uh, 36 CFR 79 standards have been amended as of yesterday to include a process to dispose and transfer of federal collections. Um, I've been working for some time on uh, trying to do a kind of a mirror of that regulation for state collections and I've actually had a, f a few folks, actually even some paleontologists uh, up at CU Boulder, uh, really um, I'm grateful to uh, their uh, time to review that. Um, and also we've field tested it um, now with two institutions. So I'm pretty confident that these things will work fairly well, but we'll talk about it um, on June 9th at 1 p.m. So if you can join us for that confab, the registration link will be available in the next uh, Curation Notes newsletter. So, and if you don't receive that, um, please sign up or email me and we can get you um, all the information that's needed for that um, important um, discussion. It will be more probably um, discussion than presentation uh, for this next confab, but um, really happy to have all of you uh, join in on that. Um, and with that, we're going to move on to our paleontological fossils that uh, make up so many of our collections. and. Um, you know, what, how do you properly care for them? Our rules and procedures talk about uh, that all repositories are allowed to do some simple mending uh, of collections, but you know, what does that mean? What, what, what does that entail? Can we elaborate a little bit more on that? What are some all kinds of questions that come up with fossils? Many of which all of our repository partners aren't really experts at caring for them. Um, and Kristen and Nicole, I had sent you some of the results of a survey that we put out. Um, this is kind of uh, how Google um, provides some of the information in these kind of really interesting charts, which are a little bit hard to read, but um, uh, I know that that was probably very helpful to you guys in putting together this uh, presentation today. Um, uh, the top answer, the top question uh, was, you know, what environmental um, levels are, are needed uh, was one of the top uh, questions that was posed by the fo folks that took the survey, um, as well as a number of other things that I'm sure that uh, Nicole and Kristen will touch upon today. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce our two presenters, and I'm deeply, deeply um, thankful for their willingness to uh, be a part of today's discussion. Um, and our DMNS partners have been so helpful to this program um, uh, and on all sides. But I'd, I'd really like to thank today Kristen McKenzie, um, who is the Collections Manager for Earth Sciences, and Nicole Neil Yogel, who is, uh, and I'm sorry if I f get that last name incorrectly, so please correct me. No worries. <laughs> the Assistant Collection Manager at DMNS as well. So thank you both for, for joining us, and hopefully we'll have some time for more discussion. And I know you've got a, a fantastic amount of resources available, which I'm going to put into the chat for everyone to access. 
um, here in a minute. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, so we kind of, you know, did our own interpretation of that list of questions. Um, so if we kind of missed what you were wanting to know, if you could put it in the chat, Todd is going to uh, monitor the chat for us and then uh, hit us up with questions. I'm going to try to speed through a lot of this stuff so that um, we can spend more time on like the environmental stuff. Um, I'm going to go through uh, kind of the first part here and then Nicole will trade off. She's got a lot more training in environmental and pest control. Um, and that makes her happy to talk about. <laughs> and so um, I'm going to start and we kind of bend the questions into kind of groups of, you know, whatever kind of made sense to stick it together. Um, so yeah, Todd, let me know if there's any questions as we go through. Also, I'm going to refer to a ton of resources that we are giving you. And uh, Todd is going to give you the link to that. Um, but I'm going to refer to that constantly. Um, and after this is done, if you guys want to shoot us any questions you have, please feel free. Um, and, and we can always be a resource for you guys <clears throat> in the future, especially with, you know, trying to ident identify stuff. Um, little things like that. We can share workflows, all kinds of stuff. Um, anything else to add? No, you covered it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I kind of lumped in accepting fossils. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, we are, the, our backdrop is the amazing snow mass, yeah. um, snow mastodon, you see femurs back there, <laughs> and I don't think, you, I don't know if you can see the jaws, but um, those are all nicely spread out on our collection shelves. We're coming to you from our collections space in the app center uh, at DMNS, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, Maybe, should we do a little bit about oh, background? I, I don't know. Let's just get into it. <laughs> Let's just get into it, okay. <laughs> so some of the things that were asked on accepting fossils, what factors should I consider when accepting uh, fossil collections? How can you identify between an identifiable fossil and a non-identifiable fossil? And how can I identify fossils in my collection? So identifying fossils in your collection and in general, that is something that takes, I'm sure all you guys know, it just takes years of practice, um, looking things up and comparing. Uh, but we've also put together a lot of uh, helpful hints and guides for you. Um, the main thing that we think about when we're deciding whether to um, accept a fossil is, we go right back to the very beginning. And there's policies that govern everything that we do at the museum. Um, starting with our ethics policy. And um, that kind of guides how we act in the community and what, what we think is okay and not okay to do. And um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of ethics uh, um, and moral issues surrounding uh, fossil collections today. You know, think of Myanmar, um, Amber, and all the genocide that's happening around that. That's an example of something that we will no longer accept because of that genocide going on over there. Um, so ethics, our ethics statement, we've added in the resources. It's, um, it's, a, it's a quick read, but it kind of gives you an idea. If you guys don't have ethics statements ready uh, for your museums, um, this could give you kind of a template. Um, so one of the things that it, um, so the ethics statement, it says acquisitions, acquisitions are made in support of the museum's mission and must be accompanied by a legal title or in the case of government owned specimens, documentation establishing guardianship authority over those collections. So that's kind of first and foremost, who owns that fossil? Is it, is it US Forest Service? Is it uh, Colorado State? Is it the BLM? Um, is it a private citizen? There's different rules for every one of those acquisitions. Um, and then our ethics statement guides our collections policy. So we've also added in there our uh, collections policy manual, and that gets into the nitty gritty of what we'll accept, why we'll accept it, uh, the rules surrounding it. Um, who has the else? authority? Who has the authority? Yeah. Uh, who owned it? Um, 
and now what kind of authority are they giving to us? Um, and then both the ethics policy and the manual of collections policy, kind of like the rules, um, informs the long-term collections plan. And so I've, I've added in our Earth Sciences long-term collections plan to give you an idea. And that's mainly a document that talks about um, uh, our sub-collections. So like, for example, you know, we have stuff from all over Colorado, but we have a very, we have a very great collection of Morrison fossils. We have a great collection of Kaparowitz down in Utah, um, the Willwood from up in Wyoming. So those are our sub-collections. Um, and then it, it goes the same on the Pilling Botany side that Nicole yeah. manages. And the long-term collections plan analyzes, okay, what do we have? What is, what is the research value of that collection? And then can we support that collection? Um, can we support it rehousing with staff time? Um, you know, all the, can we physically and financially support taking that fossil? Um, and so all these policies help guide us to the decision on whether we should accept something or not. Um, and then it kind of, kind of boils down to, at the end, a curator's decision on whether they're going to accept those fossils. Um, and I don't know, you wanna say anything more about that? The, um, just the, the repository agreements are usually done with our uh, registrar, the curators and uh, an outside researcher. Uh, and they often reach out to us because they're collecting off of government land right. and know that we're the repository and um, will be prepared for whatever amount that they're bringing. Yeah. <laughs> And they know what they need to give us when, right. we, when okay. they bring us the things. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so we're going to go into uh, kind of the second section of accepting fossils. By the way, we added in a repository agreement um, into the um, list of resources that you guys can look at. We also added in, so as part of our repository agreement, we um, require a certain format of data to come into us. And so you'll see on this next slide that we have, I mean, the data, that is absolutely critical to us. If it has no data, it's not useful to us at all. Um, there might be a rare occasion when something goes to the education collection, um, but as a whole, we don't want to, to spend resources on fossils that have no scientific value, um, and especially with no data. Uh, so, okay, so you've got resource repository agreement to look at. Um, what else was I? Oh, the uh, example field catalog? Yeah, the, that field inventory is a yeah. field catalog. And we give that to those who have the repository agreements so that they know what data we need. Um, yeah, so that's got uh, an actual field inventory from, and that is what we require um, outside uh, researchers or environmental companies to give us the data. Um, we've you know, marked out the, the actual Latin longs, but you can see exactly what we need to actually uh, accession a fossil. Um, do you have any questions before I kind of jump into identification, Todd? Um, no, except maybe, can you talk about scientifically valuable maybe a little bit? Yeah, that's what we're gonna talk about next. Yeah, so that kind of goes in with the identifications. Um, if we can't tell what it is, it has limited <laughs> scientific value. Um, so, uh, and some of it, um, like with plants, uh, it doesn't need to be a fully preserved leaf uh, all the time. Uh, there are some features that are diagnostic, like the venation pattern, margins, attachment, and apex, and the size and shape. And sometimes all you need is a half a leaf or just those really important parts. Same would go for an invertebrate. Uh, it may not need to be whole as long as a, a good lip or suture or umbo, or if it's a soft body fossil, it's a piece of it is still amazing. Um, it's hard to generalize for all. Like, for example, yeah. a fossil grasshopper, all you need is its leg and you know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's a pretty, it's a pretty subjective um, call. And at least for vertebrates, let me grab a vertebrate. And then... Like in an invertebrate. So Nicole's got this uh, really cool bivalve. Is this a rudist? It's uh, or the it's a oyster. 
Oyster. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you, you have to get to know your subject first. Usually on, on vertebrates, you've got a, you need some sort of end component, um, but it's really variable. So you need an articular surface. Um, you know, the rib sections are not going to tell you much. Um, you need preferably both ends. <laughs> uh, teeth are always identifiable, almost always. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how else to... Okay, so we really rely a lot on our curators to determine this, but if you don't have that resource, um, we have a lot of links to different data aggregators, so you can look up different areas and kind of look at a bunch of photos of things and compare your fossils to. And there's also a lot of avocational communities in Colorado clubs um, and volunteers, uh, like for invertebrates, um, retired individuals from like mining companies often would love to come and identify your inverts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so inverts are kind of strange because they're like on this bivalve, let's see, camera, that's the kind of the, well, inside, outside, these are two shells squished together. But on bivalves, you know, you've got to have that hinge point uh, where the two connect together. On gastropods, you really need that whole operculum, the opening. Um, and and typically part of the apex of the of the whorl. Um, so it really depends. You just kind of have to bone up on your subject. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do and, it was a Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but if you're if you're running into uh, how do I identify a fossil, you know, that's where you can use that list of um, I think we put like 10 or 20 resources to get you started. And also Nicole and I are a great resource for all of you out there. And as long as you send us something with a scale bar, you gotta yeah. have a scale bar. <laughs> um, and you know, if, uh, let's see, like on a vertebrate bone, what we need to identify it is several shots. So we need um, medial and lateral. So like the inside and outside of that little wing bone. <laughs> <laughs> and then we need a straight on shot of the articular surface. And in some, some cases, teeth, you know, you might need a kind of a transverse or oblique shot, um, an occlusal shot. Um, but as I'm talking, I'm telling you the things that are actually identifiable, right? So you need, on teeth, all you need is one piece of the crown usually. Um, on tusks, just having the tusk material is actually very useful. Um, there's, yeah. yeah, it's really something that you have to build up over time of yeah. just looking at thousands of fossils constantly through the years yeah. and reaching out. Um, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, there is one question from okay. Julia. She says, uh, for paleo consulting orgs that reposit at DMNS, do you require them to also include their final reports or just inventory and field data? Um, we don't have that. We don't have that stipulated in our agreement, I don't think, but we, we would like it and we try to ask for it. Um, usually, you know, like with SWICA or um, some of those bigger companies, they have a, um, they actually file a nice report and uh, they'll always give us a copy and that's incredibly useful. And I would say try to get that always. Um, and that's actually probably something that we should specify. But if it's a, like a researcher, we do require a copy of their publication, um, copy of any data they generated. Um, if they did something that's destructive, we do require the residual um, residues and, and remnants back again. Okay. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I just wanted to say that that big open space, the space that's in the photograph is where everything gets brought um, first into the museum. So that's all the field jackets. And you can see sometimes there's very funny methods of transportation, like the little kiddie pool was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then there was a lot of questions that kind of lumped into uh, preparation curation. A lot of this stuff I'm not going to go into in depth at all. And that's because I sent you guys some really amazing resources. Um, and I really encourage you, to, if you ever can take a class from Amy, Amy Davidson at the AMNH, I think she's still at the AMNH, pretty sure. Um, 
but if you can ever take any classes from her at like an AMP or a, uh, SVP, I would highly recommend it. She's got great um, processes for uh, simple fixing, um, rehousing techniques. Connie O'Connor says that Amy retired a couple of years ago. Oh, did she? Oh, that sucks. She's amazing. She's amazing. Okay, so some of the questions you guys had, how can I conduct simple mending repairs without a conservator or restoration specialist? Um, when should I call a conservator restoration specialist? What is fossil prep? When should I use a preparator? How do I clean a specimen? Differences between molding and casting? Uh, questions about labeling? How should I handle and store vertebrate paleontology collections? Um, okay, so a lot of that is really covered in those in-depth resources that we gave you. Uh, where's, where's my resource page? Oh, okay, yeah. So a lot of that is in there. Um, what I would can I would I would think about what is your expertise le level? Have you been trained in a lab? Do you know what um, the the more uh, modern archival glues and techniques are? Um, that is also in one of those Amy Davidson uh, PDFs that we sent you. Um, but I would say it's it really depends on your expertise and and what you guys are set up for there. I would say simple breaks, that, that's pretty easy. And if you have something that's exploded into a thousand pieces, and if you're not an expert on that, I would definitely call in a conservator or um, a consult with any sort of prep lab around here. You can always contact Natalie Toth here um, and get an idea of the complexity of what you're getting into. Um, but I would say a jigsaw piece, you, you probably want to find a, an expert to do that um, because it, you know, it takes years actually. So our big jackets, um, let's say we had like a 3000 pound jacket. It's, you know, six feet by, I don't know, three feet wide. That'll take our lab probably, um, you know, three years if only one person is working on it. Um, and where was I going with that? I can't oh, remember. Um, and and oh, even, even the DMNS does contract prep yeah. too. So there, there's places you can send fossils. <laughs> and we can give resources for that as well. Yeah. If you guys want to contact us for you know different people that contract prep, um, please feel free. <coughs> and always, and you can always task us with you know giving you an idea of how to start or where to start. Um, some things that you'll look at the Amy Davidson paper. You definitely want to be using um, like B2, <coughs> excuse me, B72 um, for simple fixes. We always use um, sandboxes and that's for support if you need to stand things up. Um, I always have, everybody has to put a label in with what's drying because it might need to stand there for weeks. Um, <coughs> Uh, what else? Um, well, if it, if it is just like a little bit dirty, usually you can just wash it with water and a really <coughs> soft brush to get dirt off of it. Right. Um, Although some bones are, are so soft, like when they're coming out of the ray formation on the east, eastern part of the state or like asphalt, those bones are way too soft um, to use a scrub brush on. And so you might want to use um, like wooden uh, dowels instead after the matrix has gotten loosened up. Um, yeah, what else? Sometimes you can use acids and using acid, you definitely need a fume hood. Um, but things like, for example, this stuff from, <coughs> excuse me guys. So we have this matrix and if you can tell, it's really dusty. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what we have to do with this porcupine, vape, porcupine cave matrix is we've had to run it through an acid bath. Um, and so bone is like calcium phosphate. And it can hold up to some amount of acid. But you want to do experiments with pieces of bone that are not... Um, they're not really important. You know, you could use some rib bones or some uh, broken midsections of 
bones or something. But you want to try the strength of the acid first. Make sure that you have um, a strength that is not strong enough to etch the bones and strong enough to um, actually do some removal of the calcium carbonates on the bones. Um, then we have, let's see, something we wanted to say is like for invertebrates, you, you want to be very careful about um, using any acid. You pretty much don't want to use acid unless you know what you're dealing with, what kind of matrix that fossil is. Or, well, that didn't come out right, but <laughs> if you use acid on some things, you're just going to eat up your fossil. Um, so you just want to do tests and know what you're looking at first. Um, and as usual, use uh, archival consolidants. Uh, paleo body, though, we don't want you to treat yeah. the, the fossils. There's a lot of old collections of adpression, compression fossils, not just in um, paleobotany, but invertebrates where they were sealed <coughs> with a coating and all those fossils are now turning yellow and um, it limits your ability to do chemical studies on paleobotany. So just the general rule of thumb is touch it as little as possible and never touch the um, surface of the fossil on the rock. Uh, and Kristen um, is holding an example of a fossil that has actually started to delaminate from the rock, a paleobotany fossil, the cuticle, the leaf cuticle is peeling off. And that can be um, a sign of the fossil drying too fast, or it can just be inevitable. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, since it's not being compressed in the ground anymore, um, or it could be improper humidity, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but then we still want to save that piece of the fossil that's coming off in its own little separate um, container. And it'll be another additional part of the fossil because that is still useful for um, maybe partially destructive analysis. That's great. That's great. I just wanted to uh, add here that Connie said for fossil preparations, there are a couple of great resources in the prep list and the AMMP Facebook group. Yeah. Um, and they also have a YouTube page as well, the Association for Materials and Methods in Paleontology. And Julia seconded that as well. And also the Lesserv that they have, the Prep Lesserv, and the SPNHC it also has great resources. Yeah, it's been cool. <laughs> okay, real fast, you guys wanted to know. Stop sharing the screen. So oh, no, that's okay. Um, oh, because they can't see the. It's very small. Oh, okay. Yeah, just wanted to show. Okay, somebody asked if what was a cast and what's a mold. Um, and so I wanted to bring out this is called a mother mold. And this is got, this is plaster on the outside. It's a special kind of plaster that's smoother and nicer than what you would jack it with. And then on the inside, if you guys can see these silicon molds, <clears throat> the silicon mold will come out. I'm not gonna take it all the way out, but it can come out. Um, and then inside you see the cavity of where the fossil was. And I'll show you the, so here's an example of the mold, which is this resin out here with the fossil still inside the mold. And it, once the mold is done, it very easily peels off the fossil. Um, so, so that's a cast mold. Um, so then that mold, we would fill with another kind of resin and then make the positive copy or the cast of that fossil. And one thing that we never do is um, we never cast a fossil twice. Um, that it just ends up pulling bits of bone off the surface. Um, and we always keep that mother mold and one, the very first copy out of the molding and casting is called our primary cast. And that is never loaned, it's never used. It stays there pristine so that if you had to, you could recast the primary cast and not the original fossil again. <coughs> and those are usually accessioned, right? You, you take that mother mold <laughs> 
consider it really part of the fossil yeah. collection, right? Yeah, yeah we have so the cast collection. Yeah, yeah, so the the cast goes into the cast collection, the catalog, and the molds are inventoried and kept as long as the the life of the resin allows, which is usually about you know five to seven, sometimes ten years with the modern materials. So, if there's any questions on um, on uh, preparation, curation, let me know real fast. And then um, you guys ask how to rehouse a fossil. This is a very basic way. And at the very least, all we do is we put a sheet of ethafoam. Um, we have these sheets of ethafoam. Uh, well, it's not called ethafoam, this is a different one, closed cell. And then the bone goes in there. This is the very least that we wanna do for a fossil. And you don't want that fossil crowded, touching any other bones. So for example, this box needs to be rehoused because it's got bones on top of bones on top of bones. And this is part of the collection that we haven't been able to rehouse yet. So this is an incorrect, um, very terrible example. It's got this wire poking out because it used to be on a mount. So this needs conservation and rehousing. And it'll end up being, because they're all associated, we'll end up putting it in one big box. And for things that are super special, we have these ethafoam blocks that we'll cut, and this is called a cavity mount. mount. And you've got Aiden Davidson's um, uh, slideshow presentation on how to make these, and, if, and you can you really can figure it out just from going through that slide uh, slideshow. And it's they're they're pretty special because these um, you can sink these boxes into the archival mount, and these have. Uh, the bits and pieces that we cannot find fits on the major fossil um, in these two associated with the main specimen. And so they're pretty awesome. You can do, this is Tyvek, and then underneath will be poly, you know, like a cotton um, padding or something. But all you have to do is follow that Evening Davidson presentation. And that's all I've got, and Nicole's got a lot on environment. Yeah. This uh, photo is just an example of our little label, which we had here with Lasco and archival paper printed out on the skull of the specimen. Oh, and I forgot, there's also a whole guide from Amy that tells you how to mark fossils, because I know that was a question. So it tells you what to use as far as materials and how to do it. Pictures, everything. Cool. So I've got a list here of the 10 agents of deterioration and everybody who's a collection spoke here has already seen this, I'm sure. Um, and I chose an image of our paleobotany specimens in a cabinet as ultimately cabinets help with every single one of these agents on this list. And what is the risk of greatest concern for you is gonna vary a lot on your environmental and building situation as well as what kind of fossils you have. The most sensitive fossils are going to be amber primarily, as well as pyritized fossils, quaternary fossils, and those that still contain organics, uh, leaf fossils with cuticle, like those that we showed, um, and some calcium carbonate and limestone fossils. And if you only have a few of those, you can create a microclimate to handle those amongst overall in the world of collections. Fossils are pretty robust, and usually the greatest concern is going to be the handling and storage of the fossils. Uh, most damage is going to happen during transport. Archival housing and safe handling help address the physical forces. Disassociation, as we've mentioned, can render fossils scientifically worthless. Uh, having good habits with tags and labels is critical. Um, environmentally, uh, the greatest concerns are often going to be swings in relative humidity and exposure to water. For fire and water, the two main things you can do proactively, besides having the cabinets, um, are to have good regular building maintenance and have an updated emergency plan and procedures. Dust is dangerous. Again, cabinets help. Um, dust will raise acidity, uh, the organics like skin cells and dust, and also there's mechanical damage with the removal of dust. Um, boxes with lids can also help, especially um, susceptible specimens. Light overall is not a huge concern for most paleontology collections, but if your collection space has windows, it's still advisable to cover those windows and protect the objects. There are minerals that react to extended exposure to light. 
Amber is an example of a fossil that is will react, it'll craze and crack um, with ex exposure to light. Pests, um, the labels are more susceptible than actual fossils to pests, but it's still always important to prevent fossil, um, to prevent pests from the fossil areas. Um, museumpests.net is my favorite go-to resource. And um, if it makes you feel any better dealing with IPM, every museum is kind of piecemealing their IPM integrated pest management uh, protocols together. And then the last one of these agents I wanna talk about was the criminal, which is security. We preserve fossils on behalf of the people and we keep them secure for the people. So our jobs are to work to balance access with preservation and um, locking cabinets or rooms, um, cameras, badge access. If you can't do those things, at the very least, having a sign-in sheet for your collection spaces or the museum entrance in general, it's a good thing to do. And I wanted um, to show you um, our, a graph actually from our spaces in the museum temperature, for temperature and environmental levels. Cool is good, um, slows down mold growth, and any chemical reactions, the image on the right is a ludlamite that has um, deteriorated just from continued display, uh, exposure to vibrations, light, uh, and probably just general um, chemical de degradation with the pyrite that's likely in the matrix of that mineral. Uh, and for relative humidity, the stated ideals are going to be about 40 to 50 percent RH, and that is very difficult here in Colorado. We have very low RH, and even the DMNS is working on fixing swings in RH levels that happen seasonally. Um, so you can even see um, between April and July when we replaced a bunch of humidity nodes in our HVAC system, and it isn't going as low as it used to. The faded outlines are the RH, by the way. Um, but it is something that we struggle. But if you have things in a cabinet, it helps a lot. So hopefully you can see the faded, the faded outlines are um, relative humidity. The dark lines are temperature. And this is just our geology space. And then inside of a geology cabinet is the red lines. And you can see the lines of the RH for inside the cabinet are much more stable. And you can even see little drops where uh, desiccants were put into the cabinet to try and keep the RH level lower than outside of the cabinets. So having a cabinet helps a lot with that too. Um, health and safety also affects the people who work with things, <laughs> not just the things as well. Um, I think Physical injury might be one of the largest things we need to think of when working with paleontological collections. We have very large, heavy objects that can hurt us. We're, we're going to work with ladders in the collection spaces, and then sitting improperly at a com computer <laughs> will injure you in the long term as well. Um, other things, um, I have this picture of the rare moldy fossil. <laughs> Fossils can get moldy if they were stored improperly in moist packaging. <laughs> um, so that, and then if you're doing preparation, dust, uh, silicosis is a thing. You need to wear respirators if you're ever dealing with extended dust exposure. Um, Wu and other preservation chemicals can be hazardous, uh, and some fossils can be radioactive. Um, it's not super common, but things like uh, from the Chinle or Morrison formations, they can contain uranium. And the biggest thing from that is also not inhaling the dust and keeping the fossils in a well-ventilated area and checking collection spaces for radon. And I have some resources for all of this as well. Uh, and then the last, again, for health and safety, um, disaster plans. And that's a whole lecture that I'm not going to give. <laughs> but I gave some resources for that. And having at the very least like a foam tree of who to contact and safety gear equi and equipment available. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> we're actually revising or creating a disaster plan um, this year and we've never had one for collections. And as we were reaching out across the, um, the museum community to find you know, a starting point, uh, nobody, really has a good one. And so that's pretty critical, especially when you think of um, the additional threats with environmental change, you got all the fires coming through. Um, that is something, 
that we are, we're worried, we're not worried, but we wanna be prepared. Um, maybe some of you heard that we actually flooded the new Avenir building in 2016. And out of that, we realized we're not ready for something like this. And so then uh, we had to, you know, rethink it and be ready for that, um, the next event. It did inspire some disaster bins in our space. And um, I can share inventories. I don't think I actually included that in the documents, but I could share an inventory of what we have in our disaster bins for every place where collections are stored in the museum. But we didn't have a written plan yeah. <laughs> to accompany them. Um, having and, and now those we revisit those bin sites um, every so often so everybody knows where they are and can grab them at the next event. And things so, like gloves and, res and some respirators can actually expire. So yeah. they need to, you have to do annual inventories on those too. That's, that sounds great. Do you mind if I pause with catch up with some questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or comments too. Oh. Um, so going back a little bit here, um, Connie said that uh, she wouldn't necessarily use sealants on paleontological, paleo, I'm sorry, paleontomology specimens as it restricts the use of SEM. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, sorry if that was unclear, but our thing is to never use those. There were old collections that have, but never again. <laughs> on any compression fossil, so anything that's smashed like that, um, that's just a carbon film, um, yeah, you don't want to treat it. Yeah. Right, and then she said there are some closed cell materials that become brittle um, in UV fluorescent lights after a while too. Yeah, yeah, there's a, always an exception, but so it's overall, I would say it's not a huge concern, but it's still good to absolutely right. live light on any collections ever, just in case. <laughs> and she also provided a, the link to the AMMP YouTube, awesome. which is great. And then um, great. also um, Julia asked uh, with the P EM2 being discontinued, what data logger do you recommend? Uh, we, I think, are going to be moving to conserve without the E, uh, and they have Bluetooth data loggers. Uh, we are still maintaining our PEM2s that we have, um, and at, we've had one die though, so we know that there's going to be a turnover as we switch over to most likely conserve, but uh, our PEST team, which also includes environmental, is currently uh, solidifying that research because we're also looking for a database for our um, pest numbers, which we haven't had. We were just using Excel sheet and Conserve does that too. <laughs> right. And then Julia says, would love to see the inventory lists for disaster bins. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. I will get that after here. <laughs> Thank you guys. If you guys are interested in materials list too, like supplies, uh, we can also get you vendor lists. Um, shoot us an email. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you very much. That would be great, Crystal. Cool. Yeah. Anything else? That's it at this point. Okay. Keep I'm it coming. To, I'm going to try to really buzz through this so that we have time for questions. Well, we've been asking. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. So the, the two that kind of fall into this category are uh, how do I allow a paleontological researcher to study the fossil? And are there special loan requirement requirements needed for a fossil? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, some of the things that you need to think about are, um, well, okay, let, let me talk about researchers. What does that researcher look like? Um, we have a kind of a hierarchy here internally, and I think most places follow this. So our specimens are available to our internal scientists first. Um, they have that right of refusal to whether, you know, they want to claim that fossil as their study material. Um, and then we kind of trickle down next is outside researchers, um, which the curators must vet. So, you know, most everybody knows each other in paleo or it's definitely the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, if we don't know a researcher that has requested something, um, we're definitely asking around if, if there's some sort of red light go off in our head about the request. Um, we, we do take that seriously. That is the curator's responsibility to say, is that person um, allowed to study this, this thing? Um, what else do I want to say about that? Well, yeah. Um, and then you need to, yeah. 
Uh, just like, if there's multiple researchers requesting the same thing, that's something right. to keep in mind to balance the right. Um, so if there's an active Fair project, enough. you want them to be able to finish their project. Right. So we so kind of hierarchy outside researchers, and then we go grad students, um, and then um, undergrad students, and then we typically do not loan out to anybody else um, unless it's you know something to go on exhibit. Uh, but we we keep a pretty tight hold on who's allowed to see it or study it. Anybody can come here and see these fossils. You know, they belong to the public, but we really do vet how that thing gets studied. Um, and then as she said, other researchers might be interested in the same thing. And so what we'll typically do or the curator will do is we'll, you know, we'll send an email out to both of them and say, you know, this person is interested in studying X, Y, Z that you're working on. Um, what is your feeling on the situation? And most people are like, yeah, right. You welcome, this is a scientific process. We welcome um, other people doing the, trying to do the same thing or disprove you or whatever it might be. So it, it usually doesn't, um, we usually can, it doesn't really interfere usually. Kristen and, and uh, Nicole, if one of our other partner repositories had a request to look at a specimen that they have, um, and they didn't really know that individual could, would, would it be fair if they could uh, contact DMNS or some of the other folks? Yes. In the yeah. Program? If you guys have concerns about people or the, the nature of the request, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Or even just to get feelers out to see what kind yeah. of research is being done. Is it, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but there are people out there that you don't want in your collection. And we know who they are. And, we'll <laughs> so, and we deal with it appropriately, um, unfortunately. So, uh, okay, so then probably the most important thing next, in, if you're gonna loan this thing, is who owns the fossil? Um, we have, so there's different policies that govern state, federal, and private uh, donations. Um, so you need to know who owns your fossil first. And so, like for instance, I think I stuck in the state of Colorado's, um, something trust, I can't read the rest of that. Oh, held in trust document governing loans. Um, Thanks for doing that, Kristen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's very different than um, what our agreement with the U.S. Forest Service or with the BLM. And because all this gets so confusing and whether that loan is for research or destruction or CT scan, um, you need to know all those factors because there's different rules that guide all of those activities. And just to show you that it's, it's just as confusing to us. And so, in the resources, I put a little rubric in there that we use. It's our decision tree. Well, it's not really a decision tree. It just kind of maps things out for us. Who we need that, to ask for permission. Yeah. Who we, need, <laughs> who we need to ask. Oh, yeah. CT scans. Oh, yeah. Something going out of state. No, we got to ping Todd first. Yeah. Go across state lines. That is fantastic. It's a great um, rubric that you've developed. Yeah. So that that is, that we live by that. That's our golden golden rule there. Um, I put in a loan agreement document that you guys can read at, you know, you, if you're dealing with a student, you want to loan to that student's advisor. Don't, don't, um, loan to that student. You may never get your collection back. Um, you know, they graduate. So move on. Be there longer and yeah. is probably listed on the insurance documents somewhere. Yeah. And should be there. It usually should be their advisor. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, don't do something that we just don't do is loaning to a private individual. We loan to uh, um, we want to loan to a place that is got secure collections. You know, they can be stored properly, housed properly, and they're going to be under you know secure circumstances. Yeah, and otherwise, like a private individual, like even an artist or something, they will be coming here not the fossils going to them. Right. Um, and in general, we'd rather have people come here, but we do ship out quite a bit. Um, and it's always extremely nerve wracking to ship a loan. <laughs> um, you, you know, so when we ship that loan, we um, make sure that we know what the condition report is. And then that's probably something I should have stuck in there for you guys. And then when it comes back, if we know any damage, then that needs to be documented and uh, kept in our registration files. Um, and then, you know, should we need to uh, claim damages, 
uh, all that pre-documentation and then post-documentation is very important. Um, and you want to include pictures with that. Um, uh, loan catalog material only. <laughs> and we're... <laughs> There was a lot of leeway taken in the past and we're dealing with that now. <laughs> yeah, it's just catalog at first, you'll thank yourself later. Yeah, you'll think future yourself. collections manager will thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, so Nicole and I have like a, a decade of cleanup from maybe some of the looser ways of doing things in the past. Um, but yeah, cat, cat, don't, don't send out uncatalog material and unmarked material um, and get photo book documentation. What was the... Um, and as for special loan requirements needed for fossils, yeah, take a look at our loan document and it specifies everything. Um, and then obviously we can write in spe uh, special circumstances for some things. Yeah. And, um, who to thank as well. Yeah. Little one. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I think that's all I have on loans. We can answer questions if you guys want to. Do you have anything more to add? The very last thing was um, kind of, Looping back in exhibitions, um, there are sometimes we'll extend loan requirements if the specimen needs certain requirements. Um, one example that immediately pops to mind was some aquamarine that fades in light, and we just had to double check with the museum putting it on exhibit that uh, they were using certain lumens that weren't going to unnecessarily damage the object. And um, when we've uh, sent fossils out of the country, we've actually had them assessed by a conservator before going. That's good. And, and follow up on your on those loans. Those those loans, we yeah. typically recommend no longer than three years. Um, mm -hmm. on those. Yeah, our standard is one year here. Good. At the very least, they should be re looked at uh, right. three years. Yeah. Um, and, and also we, I mean, something to keep in mind is uh, a lot of, Places are asking for a certificate of, certificate of insurance nowadays. And if you don't have it, try to find somebody at your museum that has that. And what it covers, you want to make sure it covers, covers your stuff and covers your specimens when they travel. Yeah, so I mean, we can go so in depth in yeah, all this stuff, but um, let me know if you guys have questions. Yeah. That's the end of the PowerPoint, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kristen and Nicole. Um, I'm going to put my gallery view on. So feel free at this point in time. I know mm -hmm. there may have been some things we didn't touch upon or things that you had more Sorry. thoughts or comments on. So. Feel free at this point in time to um, post in the chat, or if you want to just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself to ask that question or even turn on your camera so we can see who you are, um, please do so. Oh, and I was just thinking about the PEM2 units. I also, I think I put in the resources when I emailed IPI asking what data logger they recommend. They sent me a, a response document on how to assess data loggers. So that can be used to make a decision as well. Sorry, I just remembered that. Great. Thank you very much. Lou says, nicely done, thank you. Julie, do you have a question? I saw your video come up. No, I just uh, plugged in my webcam, so. Excellent. But. I have a question. Does the education collection at the museum have to follow, follow the same as the uh, research collection? Yes and no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, they do have a kind of separate addendum on collections policy and how they operate. Um, and one of the biggest differences is there's like an inherent knowledge that things are slowly de being destroyed <laughs> by their use. <laughs> of course. And they're much more lax on data also. Like it, a lot of their stuff just has to look cool. <laughs> 
I have another question. How and when do you de deaccession a specimen? Yeah. Um, yeah. She's been doing a lot of deaccessions lately. So, yeah. Take um, away. Primarily, the lack of data. There has, like, sometimes we'll have accession a huge donation. And once we get into you, all the nitty gritty bits of it, we realize there's a lot of stuff that has zero scientific value. Um, if it's, um, so essentially it's, if it ha has no data is the short answer to that. Um, we also deaccession things for destructive analysis, which does have to go through a lot of approvals um, um, by our whole curatorial review committee. And there has to be a good explanation and we have to get approval from the government agency <laughs> obviously um but the even though it's deaccessioned and destroyed the data is still conserved in our database yeah and still managed in our database yeah of course that's good lou if you want to join us um for our next confab um we'll be talking a little bit more about that process at least how we've tried to outline oh, it oh, okay. a little bit. so Thanks. yeah and i know that the new new amendment amendments to the rule to the federal rules is out so that might also be of assistance possibly um and we can always talk about those too um although the state ones are we'll be mirroring that pretty closely um and 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 as nicole and and um Kristen have said um any fossils that are going out of state out of out of colorado need approval from the state archaeologist and any destructive analysis also. Yeah. I was thinking, in, in deaccession, I was thinking more of non-fossils. Other, other specimens as well, but yeah. yeah. You, you cut out on that last sentence, yeah. You said non-what fossils? Or? Oh, non-state, state-owned. Some oh, that are okay. strictly belong to Dinosaur Ridge. That sure, yeah. Do. Um, and if it doesn't meet our collections scope, um, it may be deaccession to go to a better institution. One that, there was a big deaccession when I first started working at DMNS of the snow mass because we didn't have the facilities to store, so we sent it to Arizona for to be conserved in their special facilities that have researchers that will actually do research on it. <laughs> yeah, something I. I think I forgot to mention is when we're talking about accepting fossils is does it even fit your collection plan? Because you know, once you accept something, you have to keep that in perpetuity. Um, so, you know, if you've only got Morrison stuff, there's no reason for you to, to take an ash fall fossil or oh, you know, yeah. like that. Um, and, and we actually adhere to that very strictly here. We do not take stuff from anywhere. We stick with our formations and the, you know, the ages that we have developed here over time. Um, so that's, I mean, I, I would think that that's very critical for the smaller museums. Do you even have space? Yeah, Does absolutely. it in your collection plan? Is somebody gonna come here and visit it or is it gonna <laughs> better to go somewhere else where there's already people? Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a, a, a side question if that's okay. Of course. Um, so you mentioned space. Obviously, like we're all dealing with space issues. Um, I know DMNS has compactor systems. I was wondering if you're going to send out an email with some additional documents, if you could send out the specs on your compactor systems, like as far as like weight load, uh, you know, manufacturer, that sort of stuff. Would that be something you guys could do? Um, I think in general, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. So if you look at behind me, there's, um, you can kind of see that it's a rack. Yeah. And it's con composed of three of those across the, the range. And just for example, one of those racks up through that can take over 9,000 pounds. Whoops. Did I? Oh, no. What happened? Oh, they just <laughs> so fought right Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But then that's the, um, and it might be way more than that because supposedly each one of these shelves that you see the femurs on uh, can take 3,000 pounds a piece. So, you know, I don't know where the difference lies in there, but um, I'll, I'll try to find that. And, and we keep track every year of how much we fill up. So we know exactly how much space we have per project.
Anything else? Yeah, thanks, Julia. How do you how do you handle specimens? Do you use gloves? Um, we I mean we keep our hands clean. There are some specimens that you may want to do that, um, but mostly like with paleobotany, I, I just don't touch just touch edges that aren't sensitive. Um, and there may be some mineral specimens that that would be ideal to use gloves. But overall, it's just don't yeah. don't have lotion on. <laughs> Yeah, we don't we don't have our nails down. We don't yes. <laughs> we just have dry hands. Um, but yeah, there are some things that I, we can't touch. Well, we shouldn't touch for uh, the ray fauna. For some reason, um, we're not sure if it's the treatment they put on, you know, shellacked in the '30s or whatever, or the formation itself. But it gives people some people allergic reaction. And so like for me, I, I break out horribly when I touch that stuff. So I'll wear gloves when I'm working with that. But like you said, it's, you know, if you want to think about the porosity of whatever rock you're touching, if that thing, you know, it's porous and going to suck in oils, you want to wear gloves. Sure. Like Green River stuff, you know, it's better to use gloves. And most of the leaves, it's better to use gloves. But... Um, I had a question. At the beginning, you showed a, a box that had multiple specimens in it. Um, yeah. And you were saying that you ideally should have them in separate containers. Is yes. there a need for doing that other than, of course, obviously the convenience and of being able to find it, <laughs> the specimens easier? Is there um, any preservation issues associated with um, putting all, all of those together? Do they cause problems? Yeah, so uh, if you have, I don't know, see if I can, oh, she's going to, yeah, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so obviously all those bones are stacked on top of each other. This is an embarrassing box to show you. But what's going to happen is um, those bones, as they rattle, you know, because every time you move range, things shift just slightly. Like we have to go through opening and make sure, drawer. opening a drawer, things shift slightly. Um, and every time that does that, things that are in a box together like this are going to fall and crack and eventually just deteriorate and crack up even more over time. So that's why we don't want anything touching any segment of the fossil touching another part of the fossil. Each thing should be separated out so it never touches. And if you don't, and, and a lot of times we'll box, um, we'll box something that we don't want to repair um, and just put you know, the broken piece, let's say I have a piece that goes on this side, we'll just, you know, put it in this foam home right beside it. If it's something that should not go back together. That makes sense. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. And it just needs to be big enough. Um, like these paleobotany specimens, um, we'll have multiple rocks in one box. We just don't want them to be touching. This one's a little bit too wiggly for comfort, but most paleobotany specimens sit nice and flat and won't shift around and hit each other. That's great. Great advice. Thank you very much. Well, it is um, um, three past two. Mm -hmm. I do see John has said, in terms of things not being able to touch each other, what does one do to complete skeletal specimens with hundreds of bones? Yeah, let me, I'm gonna go run, grab something to show you. Yeah, um, I will say that there are sometimes huge lots of inverts where we don't really have an option. It's like literally just a box full of snails or something. And there are, there's always exceptions, I think, to best practices. And um, there will still be foam that will, limit the, the bumping that occurs. But then this is, Kristen's got, and I'm gonna lift this up, do with the skeletons. So that is a complete, horse, well, not a, it's a mostly complete horse skeleton. Um, and if it needs to expand beyond this, we'll actually just put these foam blocks in our entire drawer. We've got a couple different sizes of drawers in the collection. And we'll lay this block down and actually um, do all the rehousing in that tray in the ethophone block. Yeah. 
this is pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah that's awesome. <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think there's little vials even stuck in here. Let's see. And they're like, so there's little fragments that are touching each other technically, but they're already bumping around. Excellent. Julia says, cutting foam <laughs> is my crypto cryptonite. Any recommendations for a foam cutter knife? Yeah, we can throw some in. Um, I get a good old <clears throat> Excuse me. We have uh, we had an assistant collections manager anthropology in anthropology, sorry, that I think did a really great video on how to do all this. Um, and he's got recommendations for foams and knives and, and making jigs so that your cut is uh, straight. So we'll try to get some of that into the resources section also. That would be really helpful. That The resource section is awesome. So thank you very much for putting that together. Mm -hmm. Really, really helpful. And Brittany says, thank you so much. Great information. Any one more question? Anybody? <laughs> you very much, much, Julia says. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. I just wanted to say that um, this is John Kent again. Um, yeah. I'll, um, if you, you have my email now, and um, I just maybe want to set up an appointment to come see those materials that I mentioned yeah. to you. And uh, uh, now that I know who you are, I can contact you. So you really yeah. don't have to do anything. Yeah. yeah. Or you, if you guys want to organize a group and come out and we can, you know, spend a day and do all kinds of stuff, please do. Uh, That'd be fun. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'll I'll take that. Keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Nice offer. Yeah. Thank you all. I will have this recorded and I'll post this up on our program website. So our program YouTube channel, I should say, and hopefully it'll be helpful to everybody in the future as well. So I can't thank you enough, Kristen and Nicole, for putting this together and giving us some great examples. Um, really indebted to both of you and really appreciate all of your assistance and help. Fun, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Appreciate Have a good rest of your day, guys. Everybody. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.